All right, hello Melbourne. I hope you've all been enjoying GCAP so far. I will just say I have got a cold, so my voice doesn't always sound like this, but hopefully I can get all the way through this talk. Um, okay, so this is my talk, launching your indie game. Uh, so, first of all, who am I? Um, right, so this is me, Robert Curry. I'm from um, um, East Australia, otherwise known as New Zealand. Um, <laughs> So I've been in. The, uh, I just got my first start in the industry um, working at Sheen Directive in two thousand, from about two thousand and two to two thousand and six. Uh, that's a Wellington-based studio, uh, which is now called Pickpock. Um, got my start there doing um, uh, games, games for an Australian publisher that Australian studios didn't want to do. So games about rugby league and horse racing. Um, from there, I went uh, indie. Um, that was a very short-lived uh, MMO um, uh, that, w that I wanted to build. Build with some friends. Um, so that was about a year and a half before that, uh, unsurprisingly, didn't really work out. So then I um, entered the wasteland of web, web, web development for about five years. Um, and then in May 2013, uh, I teamed up with my, with, with my brother again to uh, enter a game jam. Uh, and that led to us um, coming up with the game Mini Metro, which is a Minimalist game about building subway networks. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, we started work on the Game Jam in May 2013. Uh, we got it out on Early Access on Steam on August 2014, uh, where it was there for 14 months before we released it in the end of uh, last year. And we just released it on phones um, two weeks ago yesterday. Uh, so yeah, so we've sold on desktop about 280,000. Uh, we've made one and a half million roughly over the last three years, which sounds like a lot when I say that, but um, spread out over all that time, it's not actually all, all, all that much. Uh, and we made 250,000 of that from off Steam. So it's that kind of stuff that I think I want to spend more more time on about, about how you can earn, earn money, not, not just from Steam. Now, when putting this talk together, I kind of, it's just sort of a shotgun um, of just all the things that I wanted to tell myself back, be back before we launched. Um, uh, so it's, it's not always the most coherent, but it's just, you know, info blast after info blast. Um, uh, the first thing, though, is that I, when going back over the talk on the flight over, I realised I'd kind of forgotten to put in the most important thing. Um, so I thought I'd just put that in first because I couldn't decide where to put it elsewhere. So, most important thing I think that we learned from, from the game uh, that we did is that the, the name of your game is vitally important. It's the only piece of information that everyone talking about your game has to use. So even if they're slagging it off, they have to use your game's name. So if you want it, you should use it to either sell the gameplay or the mood or something about it that makes your game your game. Um, so obviously, Obviously, with our game name, it hints that it's a small game about building subway network. Maybe subway networks. I mean, not um, everyone, not everyone gets that from from the name. But also, if you combine it with your imagery as well, you can really sell the idea of of, of the game. And uh, the important thing about this is it it. It pulls people towards your game that like your game and hopefully pushes people away that don't like your game. So because of that, we've got uh, a 96% uh, uh, positive rating on Steam, which I think puts us in about the top 70 games. Now, I'm not saying we are among, we are like one of the 70 best games on Steam. It's just that we manage to not sell to people that don't like the game. So um, I think it's one of those things that, yeah, it's a very key point is don't, don't only pull people towards your game, but also make it obvious and push people away who you know will not like your game. Um, so if I could go back and just sort of tell me anything about that, um, about that one, one piece of information, it would probably just be, yeah, I mean, we just sort of completely fluked it, uh, uh, fluked it with this. We, um, we didn't really come up with this through any sort of intentional effort on our part. Uh, but it's just kind of one of those things that having a look back on it, we can see that that's worked out very, very well for us. Um, so, right, first off, marketplaces. Where are you going to launch your game? Steam. Well, Steam is, of course, where you have to be. Um, 
I won't really focus too much on that because, I mean, you know you have to be on there. Um, they, just, they just do an excellent, excellent job at getting your game in front of people that they think will like your game. So, um, so right, the other thing is your website. Now, you might think this is a really, that not many people do buy games from websites, but it, it is surprisingly high. It's our, uh, um, after Steam, which, which does represent, I should say, about 85% of our sales, uh, it is our, our second best um, uh, uh, revenue driver. The thing about, um, about it, though, is you need there to be a reason for people to come to your website. Now, we've always always had a completely free playable demo on, on the website, which has always helped. Uh, we still get about five to 10,000 visits a day just, just to actually play, play that game. Um, and, but the thing is, is that fraud is a big, big issue. Uh, one of, probably the biggest thing that, that uh, uh, marketplaces help you out with is that they, they avoid credit card fraud, um, th things like that. Yeah, stolen credit cards, chargebacks, things like that that you do not want to or want to have to have to worry about. So, um, besides that, humble. Now, humble are just really nice to deal with as well. Um, the good thing about humble as well now is that they they don't only do do uh, DRM free. They they do now that you just just sell Steam keys. This is a small difference, but what it means is that if you can guarantee everyone that buys your game is going to be on Steam, it means that you know that things like the Steam leaderboards and everything like that, everyone will be on, on those same leaderboards. I'll, I'll get into that a bit more later. Um, the thing about Humble, though, is that if you're not on the homepage, you, you're not really going to sell anything. They, they don't have a very big uh, push to kind of get your game in front of people. So, I mean, we sell under 10 copies a day on, on, on Humble. It, that is, that is if we aren't on the, on the homepage. The other great thing about Humble is if, if you are on Humble, you also get, get, to, get to use the Humble widget, um, uh, which you can see there. Now, this is just basically a wee little HTML thing you can put on your website, and it means that, that anyone can buy your, buy your game from your website without, without ever actually leaving it. It will go into the Humble account as well, uh, and they basically handle all of the all of the um, um, all of the all of the credit card stuff, uh, and you get I think it's about a ninety percent revenue of, of that as well, which is a lot higher than you get on any other marketplace. So if if you only use Humble for one thing, the, the um, 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 Humble would Humble widget would be it. Now uh, Gog Gog's probably the the only oh, perhaps it's I suppose, but. Yeah, GOG is probably the, the next, it, it's the only big other marketplace, I think. Um, it seems like it's, an, like it's a no-brainer to, to be on GOG, however, it does come with a few hidden costs. Uh, the thing that we found is that, so they, 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 they have their own, their own Steam-like desktop client. This, you will have to integrate with that as well, so leaderboards, achievements, uh, I think it's also got, uh, uh, um, um, save, save syncing as well. It seems like it should be like a one-for-one -one exchange with the Steam API, but it's not. It seems to be just enough to be a wee bit of a pain. Um, so, I mean, it pr probably took us maybe three days of integration work, but it is there. And they only do, only do a DRM free as well. So the thing you've got to think about is that once you go to GOG, it means that people that buy it on GOG will be on inside the kind of infrastructure and community and it means that like they'll they'll have their own leaderboards and high school charts and, and all of that sort of thing um, so it, it it kind of gives them maybe like I guess it kind of depends on what kind of game you have if you have kind of a strong uh, community aspect to your game it can make it can people that buy it on God can seem like they get a much smaller uh, a smaller aspect of that compared to if you have it on Steam. So, uh, it, in our game, we um, we 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 have a have a daily challenge. Um, the Steam one has maybe a few thousand a day. Uh, Gog has somewhere between like three and eight a day, and it just yeah. So it just looks they they it kind of gives them the impression that they bought kind of a lesser version of your game. 
solution to that, of course, is, is to kind of roll roll your own own, own high scores things in, across all, all the versions of, of your game. So it kind of depends on if that's a thing you're willing to do um, or if you just want to kind of skip it and um, only go through Steam. Oh, excuse me. So the thing about you have to realize about marketplaces is they're not in it for your best interests. They are only in it for their best interests. Usually these align, but not always. So they just want to sell games, and you want to sell your game, and hopefully they'll want to sell your game. You can you can make this decision easier for them if you kind of help them out and promote the things that they want to sell as well. This is a big thing with. Steam. Steam has, you know, they've got, they've got uh, Steam controllers. They've got, the, they've got the Steam Workshop support. They've got the Vive, all of that kind of thing. The more you can integrate with the things that they want to push, the more they will help you promote your game. Uh, so, for example, Vive and Steam controller compatible games are, are frequently featured a lot more than other games. So it's just a thing that if you can, if you can fit this stuff easily in, you should. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, if you keep keep them team happy, then they'll keep you happy. Um, now there are a few others. Um, there are many, many of these. Um, I'll get back to I'll get back 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 to, back to them in a minute. So, if I could jump back in time to 2014, what are the what are the what are the most important things about marketplaces that I would say? Probably, as I guess you've um, um, picked up already, I, I think our DRM free release was probably a mistake. Um, it's kind of, it, it's a nice thing to do with DRM free release, um, but it does fragment your user base. And so we're hoping to add a map editor at some point. And so we know that then that's going to be, that's gonna, gonna, going, going to integrate with, with Steam Workshop, but then everyone that's put it on GOG or anywhere else, we're like, well, are we going to roll our own workshop for them or are we going to just sort of say, sorry, here's a Steam key perhaps. Um, and the other thing is, is that Steam, you don't actually have to use Steam's DRM if you don't want to. You, so we actually don't, but we just don't really advertise it. But you can just run the game without Steam and it works fine. So you kind of can still do that. And if anyone complains about it, you can just say, well, you don't actually need, like, once you've got it on Steam, you don't you don't have to actually use Steam. Um, oh yes, and the other thing, uh, Linux support is a thing we added because you know you can just do compile to Linux done. Um, that, that's not a good idea. Uh, Linux, it, our Linux user base is about two percent. Uh, our Linux support requests are about twenty percent, and we don't really have the capacity. I mean, we do what we can to get it running on Ubuntu sixteen point oh four, but once it gets outside of that, we're just lost. I mean, it's like uh, we can provide some basic help, but it's but um, basically almost all of our emails are uh, we only support it on Ubuntu 16.04. You know, anything else you're on your own. So yeah, don't launch on platforms you can't support properly. Publishers, right? Let's talk about publishers. So uh, the things publishers can help you with now that that uh, list list of all those marketplaces that I showed you, we're on all of those. We didn't do any of that ourselves. We, we have a publisher now that just basically helps us with all of our non-Steam, GOG, Mac, Mac Store and all that stuff. Um, and that is, that makes it really easy because basically we just sort of send, send them a build and some assets and, and they just build up all the store pages and all of that stuff. Um, handling updates as well is a pain if you have to email it around to, you know, you know 80 different storefronts when they can just do 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 all of that for you, uh, and also community management. Um, I'm having a look at all of the individual forums and answering answering the easy questions, and also aggregating revenue. Um, Steam is good because it just you, you just basically gets it just gets 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 deposited in your account account every month. Most of the other ones they'll kind of email you an invoice and you have to invoice them for that much and then hope you get it and then kind of compare and and make sure. Uh, whereas instead we just basically get a thing every month to say this is how much you've earned and that's it. Uh, so that can cut back on like maybe two days of uh, um, um, invoicing work, work every month. And they just kind of know their way around the marketplace the way that you wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily know and they can, they can, they can hunt, out, hunt out extra, extra opportunities. 
uh, which also which we'll also get get back to on an, on another slide. So the the bad points is they take cash. You know they 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 not they don't do this for free. However, you just you you have to really uh, look at this as the fact that they're doing all the work you don't want to do, and you're paying them to do that. And also, they'll probably increase your your revenue by more than you have to pay them anyway. So odds are, it's almost always worth it. Another thing is is that if you want to make the relationships with you know Apple and Google or, or your Steam rep or things like that, then you might want to either do that yourself or just go it alone because odds are like you'll 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 talk with with your with your publisher and they'll and they'll talk with everybody else. So it, yeah, if you want to make those make those uh, 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 business connections just help. It's just a thing to think about. And also all of the coding work you'll 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 almost almost always have have to be have to be doing yourself. It just depends on the relationship. And a thing we found is that they generally, uh, depending on who you've got, um, you have to sort of check in the early days to make sure that they sort of uh, respect your image as much as you do. We, we've had some cases where they've they prepared some some uh, uh, promotional materials and it, it hasn't really looked that good. So we've had to basically redo everything from scratch. Um, so I guess it just pays to sort of ask around and make sure that the whoever you've gone with has has a good reputation uh, for for um, making sure that your brand is respected as much as theirs. So things to think about when when you are signing up with a publisher is uh, shop around. Don't don't only ask one, um, uh, but do focus your efforts on publishers that you know work within the spaces that that you're interested in. Uh, and also, if if you are emailed and you know, you know someone says someone offers someone offers you a publishing deal, don't always accept the first one. I'll it'll, it'll be a, a, a lowball offer, and just just ask around, ask other indies, or ask other publishers if they're interested. Um, now, the big thing is is you need to see them as an equal equal um, in your relationship. So don't see them as as the enemy, but you want to give them enough of an incentive to make you both uh, new opportunities. So it can be very common to kind of want to screw them down, but just sort of, you just want to, you have to let them get enough cash to make you both more money, if that makes sense. So yeah, um, and please talk, talk to a lawyer before you sign anything, because it, it may seem expensive at the time, but it'll be, it's, it'll be a lot worse if you don't. Um, so, if I could jump, jump, jump back in time a couple of years uh, about publishing, what would I tell myself? We got four publishing offers in the first six m months or so. Some from some fairly big, big publishers, and we we were just like, no nah, man, we're indies, we're going to do this ourselves, and uh, well, we've regretted that ever since. It was just so stupid. <laughs> um, so, basically, just see them as as people on your side. <coughs> Uh, if you can find find the right one. So speaking about, about new things that that you can be introduced to by a publisher, one thing that we've had success with um, has been subscription services. So um, these are a relatively new thing for the for the uh, uh, desktop marketplace, but it's basically Spotify for games. Uh, so so you you should subscribe to them and pay maybe $15 a month and then get to play any of the games in their library f for as long as you want. And if you, uh, and if you end your subscription, you, you then lose access to, to all of the games. Uh, they are becoming, a, they are quite a small area, but it, but it is expanding and they need games to get, to get people to, to sign on. So, uh, we, yeah, we got approached by, uh, um, I mean, we had, we're on Origin right now, uh, so we got emailed about that a few months ago, and it was a thing we were quite hesitant about, even though we did get a fairly hefty advance, it was a thing, we were wondering, are we going to, like, sell out our existing Steam audience? Um, so we we saw who else was on there, and we just, and we just emailed them and asked them, like, has this affected you at all? And, and we basically heard back that, no, like, 
Steam and subscription services seem to be very separate. So, like, I mean, I didn't even know Origin was a thing, <laughs> and everyone that I asked who didn't 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 know anything about them at all. So, uh, from what and also from what we found is we haven't seen any dip at all. Um, so it was basically free cash, which is always nice. Um, uh, so I don't know whether that's going to continue. Um, I imagine it's not, and that eventually it will begin to eat into your Steam user base. And at, at that point then you've got to kind of think about how much you're actually earning from them at all, because right now you don't earn a lot. Um, if you don't, the advance is really what you're banking on. Um, a high rate of return is about a cent an hour. So if you think about how many games you've sold on Steam and what the, what the, what the, what the, and then how long the average, average playtime is, you're probably looking at somewhere between like 10 to 50 cents per game you've sold. So you have to be expecting a large uptake of, of people, but it's not going to be a hundredfold. Uh, so, as I said, make sure you get an advance because otherwise you're probably not going to earn anything from these things at all. Besides exposure, um, and as I mentioned before, talk, talk to a lawyer. You don't even know. It's going to be, you can kind of read these things and think you know what they say, but you, you don't know what they actually say. So you want to make sure that you get someone that knows, knows the market inside out to uh, read through it. So other ways to sell your game, bundles. Bundling, I was, uh, I was, I'm going to be about whether we should include this because it's not, it's not really a launch strategy, but it is a thing that you can think about anyway. Um, and I mean, if you're going for like an online multiplayer game, maybe bundling at the start wouldn't be a bad idea. But anyway, um, benefits, you do get a nice hefty bit of cash straight up, which as I said, is always good. And um, exposure, which is it kind of depends what state your game is in, as if whether or not this is a good thing or not. Uh, drawbacks: uh, it does devalue your game. I don't think you can you can argue against that. Uh, so when we were in the humble bundle earlier this year, we got about twenty thousand activations from from that, and our wish list went down by about twenty thousand. So what that told us was that people that had already seen our game and wanted to buy our game bought it at the Humble Bundle. So we didn't really pick up anyone who didn't already know the game didn't uh, um, um, existed. And instead of uh, uh, selling, selling to them a game for perhaps at half price, at $5, uh, we got maybe 80 cents out of that. So uh, there is some argument as to what the wish list actually represents. I think the general consensus is that somewhere between, uh, is that you can expect to convert somewhere between 10 and 15% of your wish list in, into actual purchases at some point. Um, so if you look at it from that, so that's cool, it's not actually that bad, but from, from our evidence, it was, it was basically that we didn't actually earn any more of an audience. And, 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 and because of that, it does, of course, eat into your long, long-term viability. Now, review scores can drop. This was an issue now. Um, this was an issue. However, now Steam is updated in the last month or so, so that now only people who bought the game on, on Steam, their review scores actually get um, um, aggreg aggregated up. Everyone else, it, everyone else's reviews are still there. They just don't actually add up into the, um, into the score, which is good and bad. Generally, bundling your review scores would kind of fall by a few percent. Um, now, of course, they won't because they can't, um, but it does affect other games as well in a bad way. Uh, and also, key, key reselling is a huge issue with bundling. The um, best thing to do to avoid this, as I think I mentioned in here, is uh, preferably aim, if you can negotiate it, don't be in the, in the, in the bottom tier, because then, then uh, you just, you're, just, you're basically handing out Steam keys for about five cents a piece. Uh, so yeah, now there are heaps of these sites out there. I don't know, I don't know how many, um, how many there were, but I've found out now there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these things. You'll get a lot of offers. Uh, not all of them very good. So make sure that you research who these sites are if they have a good reputation, and also what other games they want you to be in with. Um, 
we got approached by a bundle site that wanted to put us in a bundle with Postal. And we were like, eh, that's not really the image we're going for. So we just said, no, that just, that just isn't going to happen. Um, and, and also, it's another good thing. You kind of, you, you don't want to be the best game in the bundle and you don't want to be the, the I mean, what I'm saying best or worst, I, I, I suppose I'm saying like the one that's going to pull, pull the audience in. Um, and yeah, yeah, if you can negotiate a price here, that's um, um, awesome, as I said. And again, talk to a lawyer first. Um, you just want to kind of watch out for things like what they'll do with the Steam keys that they don't sell. Often they'll just basically end up end up hocking them off them, hocking them off them themselves on a uh, Steam key reselling site, which isn't really what what you what you're after. Um, so if I could jump jump I'm back in time about about all this uh, billing and subscription stuff, what would my Message B. Basically, Origin was fine. Origin worked out really, really well. I uh, haven't had any complaints about that. But I got the impression that we did bundle maybe a year too soon. Um, I think, as an indie, I think that the term, the, the term humble bundle is still kind of like a badge of honour that you kind of want to have on your... Uh, and I think we kind of got a bit <coughs> caught up in that. And we're like, we can be in a humble bundle, that's amazing. Um, so next off, and probably the most important bit, building buzz. So, um, yeah. So before your launch, you need buzz for a good launch. Now, it's not I'm not saying that the, every game that has been hugely usually successful, not all of them have have had good buzz beforehand. Um, but I'm just saying, you don't need to take that risk. There are for every game that 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 has succeeded, and just. Uh, that came completely out of nowhere. There are probably a hundred games that did not, and you don't know about them because they weren't successful. So, do what you can before you launch. So, these are the things that have kind of helped us. Um, so, awards, festivals, conventions, and press, and YouTubers, and things like that. Um, the biggest thing I totally forgot about, uh, which probably helped us the most out of anything, is that we had a freely playable demo, as I said, on our website. Uh, because our game is kind of odd and sounds like it's not much fun, um, people would kind of want to try it just to see what on earth it was about. And I think if we didn't have that website build that we wouldn't have convinced people that actually this is a thing that mightn't be as bad as it sounds. Um, yeah, and I'll just mention when we got, when we launched on Steam, on Steam, Steam Greenlight, our website went from about five hits a day to about 30,000 hits a day. Um, and I think it was just having the website with the game on it that everyone could just say, you, you know, just hey, here's this thing that you might that you might be interested in. Whereas if they just would send their friends to articles about it, that wouldn't really have the same impact. So um, awards, right? This is a bit sad to hear, but um, when you ask around, you realise that most people, I mean, you know, most kind of non-game game devs don't actually know about these things very much. Um, BAFTAs, I guess, does does get some some kind of uh, recognition, but you know, IGF, GDCA, ZAGDAs, and all that stuff. It's mainly kind of industry awards that don't really mean that much to everyone else. But they're really cool. I mean, it's I, I won't deny that it's awesome to, to you know to um, um, have one of those on your on your Steam page. And the other thing is, is that when you win awards, it means and. And when I say win awards, you don't actually have to win at all. You just, you, I mean, we've, we've only won one actually, one award. Uh, we've been nominated for about five others. And you, you just have to better, better say, I was up for a, you know, da 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 da, and that's enough. Um, it basically, it, it can help people get over, um, it can help them give, give you the benefit of the doubt. Because if you can say award winning, da 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 da, it makes it sound like it's actually worth the effort to investigate. Um, and the other thing is, is that getting into one festival can then help you get into the next one and the next one and the next one. Uh, when we first submitted, uh, we submitted to the PAX AIS South by Southwest and Indicate in 2014. Uh, we got rejected from PAX and South by Southwest, but we got into Indicate. And from then, we then got into um, uh, Indie Mega Booths a couple of times. Um, the IGF spafters and and that and it's kind of a just as you build up as you build up this kind of 
awareness of your game as an awards game, you just kind of get more and more of these things. Which is good, because you need a lot to actually help out. Now, I should point out, this isn't actually our game, um, but that's kind of the, what, what you need for it to actually have an impact, is like a lot of awards. So, if I could jump, jump back in time and tell me one thing about awards, it would be that her story always wins every award. Uh, damn you, Sam Barlow. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's a good game, don't get me wrong. Just if it had been released one year earlier, one year afterwards, I'd be, I'd be eternally grateful. But anyway. So, uh, festivals and conventions, things like that. So this is, this is all the kind of, kind of uh, consumer, uh, consumer trade shows and, and uh, uh, gaming festivals. Um, these are just awesome fun. It's really cool. Uh, you, meet, you meet heaps of, heaps of other, other developers and uh, um, everyone that just, just, that just enjoys your game. And it's a thing I think that they're undervalued in, is that often we just spend months and months and months at a time just working on our, you know, small parts of our game and, and adjusting this thing here and this thing here, and you just get, you, you lose sight of, of what your game is and how fun it is. And then you go to these things and you just spend, you know, three or four days just, just, just um, um, having people say how awesome your game is and that can just be really energizing and can kind of remind you that it's all worth it you know uh, however we were expecting that when we went to these things, oh yeah yeah yes yeah, so, so we went to uh, our first show was indicate in 2014 in los angeles then we went to um pax east in in 2015 and then pax west in 2015 and then we're at the igfs as well um earlier this year oh, and we'll be at pax australia on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so yeah, this article here came out, was the one article that we got from PAX uh, East. Um, so we kind of expected we'd get hit with a lot of it, but I think mainly the gaming, uh, uh, the gaming, gaming journalists are there for the big stuff and uh, the indie stuff. It, it gets looked at by indie specialist media and PC specialist media, but often it just kind of gets overlooked a bit. Yeah, so the one article that we got, um, was just about these kind of three indie games that didn't look like they were very fun, but actually were. Um, thanks, Polygon. Um, so the real thing that we've found from them is just that you get to watch your game being being uh, used for the first time over and over and over and over again, and, and you see and you see people making the exact same mistakes and thinking, why are all these people stupid in the exact same way? <laughs> but then you realise maybe maybe after like the third or fourth time, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Um, so it can help if you can adjust your build day to day. Um, make, this is very risky though, so make sure it's, you're only doing small things that don't break anything um, and that you can roll back easily. Uh, but you can get a lot out of them this way. Um, and also, you just meet people a lot. And uh, so, yeah, PAX East, as I mentioned, um, that was really expensive to go to. But the last day, we got a business card from someone working at Apple. And that was like, right, it's worth it <laughs> just for that. Um, and yeah, right, yeah, as I say, very expensive. Um, so going to PAX West, uh, that was about oh, three of us. Uh, it's about. Ten to twenty thousand dollars for a West Coast show for you know booth space, uh, accommodation, flights over there, all of that stuff. Um, I'm hiring everything that you need. Uh, going to an East Coast show in Boston that's that's just eye-wateringly expensive. Um, we went yeah we went to G GDC on the way as well for a couple of days and that was probably the better part of about thirty grand. Um, it was fun, but I don't know if it was worth it. Uh, yeah. So you can make it easier though. If you, if you can get kind of free boot, boot space um, by like being in the PAX 10 or the um, um, PAX Australasian Indie Showcase, that can, that can be really good. Um, or there's this organization called the Indie Mega Booth, um, which we've been involved with. They're, they're really good at just basically giving you um, a really good spot. They organize everything for you and they, 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 they can often arrange, arrange for like uh, free, free hireage of things like this. Is there anyone from the Indie Mega Booth in the audience? Talk, 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 talk to this guy about it. He'll um, uh, hook you up. Well, yeah. Just, just say that Rob's in you. Yeah. <laughs> All 
All right. So uh, festivals and conventions and stuff. What's what I tell myself back in uh, 2014? PAX East was our first big PAX. It was really, really enjoyable, but it was really expensive. And um, we, I don't know if this is what Boston is always like at that time of year, but I think it had just been hit by a snowstorm or something, but it was just so cold. And there wasn't really anything on after the conventions. Um, so I, I think PAX West was really good. Like there's like heaps on at PAX West and it doesn't cost as much to get to. Um, so I would definitely recommend PAX West over, over PAX East. Um, and yeah, we as we submitted again to uh, to go into South by Southwest just because that's what you do uh, this year, and we did get in, but um, we had to talk to a few people and just saying, is it actually worth going to South by Southwest? And I think we made the right decision to not go as well because I think it, it began halfway through GDC, so and and we we did the same thing again. I mean, we did that. Sorry, we missed. We missed half of half of GDC for PAX East. We we kind of found that a bit of a frustration, and we didn't want to do didn't want to do the same thing again this year. And um, from what I heard, it was South by Southwest. The gaming part of it isn't that well integrated, and uh, so it's not. I think I'd wait until I saw it improve until I actually went there. Uh, so gaming press now. Uh, there's a common, there's a thing people are talking about, I suppose, in the last few months, is that there's this idea that, that games media is their, it's their role to provide a fair and balanced amount of, amount of coverage about every game that gets released. Um, this isn't their job. Their job is to provide interesting things for their readers. So your job is to make sure that hopefully those two are the same thing. That if they write about your game, it can be interesting for their readers. So you can, if you give journalists a reason or a hook to write about your game, that makes their job easier and that way hopefully they will actually write about your game. So just it can be anything, just about what the game is about, your team, how it was developed, how you came up with the idea, just anything like that can be really, really useful. So. Our game is kind of is, has an interesting angle just because it, it doesn't you know it, it looks so plain and it's about a thing that is otherwise quite boring um, and so people find that interesting like it's just this instant hook so it it's just a thing to be wary of when you're pitching your game right at the start is that how do you get people interested in it right from the get go like just 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 by describing it or even the name of the game that has to have some sort of interesting hook in it. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to to, to dig into that, and and for for uh, uh, journalists to find the interesting thing about your game. The other thing is, is that don't expect just because you get an article on a big site that you're going to get a big boost. We we were expecting this. Uh, we had an article in Rock Paper Shotgun earlier. On. I think we've had maybe about five all up now. But the first article, we were like, "Whoa, we're on Rock Paper Shotgun! This is going to be amazing!" And nothing happened. Like you just. You, it's what these things. That, um, articles more build kind of a general back, background, background awareness of, of your game. So it's just kind of let, lets people know it exists and it's and that it's still around. Um, and that way, it's this is kind of bad, I think, to describe it this way. But it's almost sort of like just this this advertising for your game. You know, it's just you just want to see, you just want to have people read about your your game reasonably regularly, um, and then eventually that'll that'll then become a purchase. Where you will see big uh, sales boosts from is these guys. Uh, influencers and uh, YouTube personalities and whatnot. Uh, we've been featured on five pretty big streams and every, every one you just get this huge spike, um, which makes for really good days. Uh, so the thing you can do is just encourage, just make it easy for people to stream your game. Um, uh, have a, have an, have an easily accessible monetization policy uh, and just sort of do th do things with your community that, that will encourage uh, streaming. Now, a, th a common thing is that people get very stingy with their Steam keys and they don't want to give them out unless it's like a big stream at l least a 1,000 or 10,000 subscribers. Um, don't do this. Just basically hand them out to every streamer that asks. Uh, Steam keys don't really cost you anything, like they do in theory, but they, they don't actually. Um, and also, um, smaller channels are what, like, 
uh, uh, YouTubers look look to other YouTubers to see to see what what uh, uh, games they're streaming. So it can pay to just get as many people as as, as you can streaming your game, even if they're small, and then that 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 that, that might expand and build up into other streams. However, don't hand them out to everybody because probably 50% of the requests that we get for YouTube keys uh, are, are just scams. Um, so you should spend some time looking into who these people are. I mean, it pro we've got it down now. We can we spend about 30 seconds to kind of see if, they're, if they are who they say they are. Um, I won't go into, into, into how you can do that now. And it is, it is getting harder and harder as they are getting a bit more sophisticated, but you, but you can ask me afterwards, and I can provide a bit more, a bit more, a bit more information about the thing, things to watch out for. Um, other thing is, is record who you send each key to, just so then, if it does come up, then you, the, 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 then you have a record about about who was the one that actually uh, stole their key. So, ju jumping back in time, the. Biggest thing I could say about that is actually put some effort into adding streamer uh, friendly features into Mini Metro. We haven't done anything at all, uh, and if you can get that that kind of engagement uh, with this with this uh, uh, influencer market, it can just be huge. So the long tail. Now, regardless of how good your launch is, you'll always have a much much longer long long tail, so it really pays to put as much effort in as you can to just kind of get that as long and fat, fat as possible. Um, now, sales get all the kind of hype and articles, articles written about them, but you will make more than you do in your kind of months and months in between Steam sales than you will, will from the Steam sales themselves. Um, so, how do you actually stretch it out as far as possible? Well, a very, very um, helpful and actionable pe uh, piece of advice here is that the more people you have playing your game, the more people will hear about your game and then buy your game and play your game. So, basically, if you're doing well, you'll you'll continue to do well, and if you if you aren't, you won't. Not really very helpful at all. So, content. Content is always good. Uh, so, a thing that I heard from a friend is that it can be beneficial to leave out content that you're kind of hoping to get done for launch, but but um, it, but will but but will be hard to fit in, and instead just basically launch a bit earlier and then release the content afterwards. It kind of gives an indication that the game's being expanded on, and that it'll be it'll it'll um, have a long life. Uh, and also just think about what your update plan is. Uh, th this isn't, I mean, I should say, this isn't always the same for every game, of course. Like, not every game is kind of kind of update friendly. But if you if you can, just think about what the aspects of your game are that you can add and make it easy to do so. So extra game modes, characters, uh, maps, that kind of thing. Uh, if you can get your fans to build content, to spend time in your game building content for, for then other people to, to use in your game, this is just a win-win. Um, uh, we, we've got a map editor planned that's been planned for about six months. We haven't, um, haven't begun it yet, but we get a, I'll be in, I'm quite interested to see what effect that will have because it's a thing we get asked about a lot and then we basically get this infinite c content from the game, which, um, fingers crossed, will be good. Uh, and yeah, uh, people like to see that you are taking an interest in, in the community. Um, so just basically spending time on the forums, um, answering all of your emails and that kind of thing is just always good. Um, it's, it's more from the purpose, I mean, it's not only because it's a good thing to do financially, but it's just a good thing to do anyway. And, uh, it's basically people that get a bad experience from you in that regard will probably do more to push people away from your game than really anything else. And porting. Porting is always good. Uh, so we recently released on mobile. Now our Steam, we released on Steam a year ago, 
uh, the, the day we released on mobile, our Steam sales went up 200%, and they're currently now uh, about 100% up on whereabouts they were a month ago. So, and that was just from having the phone, phone version out. So it it's not only opens up new, new revenue streams, but it also kind of buffs up all, all of your old ones. Because it's just that thing that the more, the more articles you get about your game and the more people you get talking, talk, talking about, your game, about your game, regardless of, of if it's on, on the same platform or not, the more people buy your game. That's just how it works. Uh, so jumping back in time, what would I say out of myself two years ago? So as I said, we launched back in 2000, you know, 2015 and we haven't done anything at all on the uh, desktop build since. Haven't added any maps or anything. We did add one when we launched the phone version, but that was all. So maybe we should have actually spent some time and uh, added some more things like that. Um, and maybe I, should, and maybe I should wrap this up. <laughs> so that's me. Does anyone have any questions? You, sir. Um, you've done a lot of shows. How many of them have done post-launch? Right, so, 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 so the question was, um, um, how, many sh how many shows have we done post-launch? Uh, actually, oh, we were at the IG. So, OK, we've done Indicade, which was before we rebuilt Early Access. Uh, both packs, as we went to packs West and East, were done when we were on early access, but before we'd launched. And then we did, uh, we're at the GDC IGF booth, um, which was after we'd launched desktop, but before phones, and PAX AIS, which will, which, which will be out in the next few days, is the first one we, we will have done where we've launched everything, which is gonna be really good, because I can just say, you can buy it before you even leave the booth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you consider making the merchandise for the game? Merchandise, uh, we've, yeah, the game, it doesn't have any sort of characters or anything like that, anything that streams out, but we have thought about like fridge magnets, about having you can like build your own systems in fridge magnets, <laughs> or just like rectangular plushies and like red, red, grown, red grown and glow and say, look, it's a train. Um, besides that, no. <laughs> I haven't had any. Any marketplaces that we looked at and didn't release on? Uh, no, because basically we just shotgunned the whole thing and just went on everything that we could. Um, we did. I guess we didn't really pursue, like Steam was doing so really well that we didn't really push our options that much. It was more that when we got emailed, you know, um, by a shop, we would then think, yeah, yeah, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess why not? Um, so no, we were just pretty much happy to go anywhere. <laughs> Right, how do we financially sustain ourselves? Um, we did everything wrong in that regard. Um, <laughs> so the game jam, of course, you know, that doesn't pay anything. Uh, my brother jumped on it pretty much full time uh, for a few months out. Uh, we put up, um, you could buy the game on our website before it was launched. Uh, I think it was $4 or something ridiculous like that. That, was, that actually went pretty well. Um, then early access, we went to early access because the, that money was running out, which is the worst idea to go on early access. Don't go on early access just for the cash. Um, but thankfully, that actually continued reasonably well. And so, yeah, it was just basically, um, we've been really fortunate in that the webs, website, website ordering and then, and then early access has, has been enough to run full time. And, and also, he did some shows and stuff, so yeah. I know that's not really very helpful, but. Yeah. Um, have you had any issues with DRM free versions of piracy? Issues with DRM free version of piracy? Probably. I imagine we have. <laughs> um, we're pretty, I mean, piracy is a funny one. I think I've got a pretty loose attitude to it. It's like it's going to happen, and I expect that most people that pirate it wouldn't have bought it anyway. Uh, 
we did post up on Pirate Bay just saying, we just found our game up there and just said, you know, hey, this is, this is the developers, you know, it's awesome that you would be interested in our game. And, and we said, you know, you know, here's the Steam link if you're interested. And um, we did get an email from somebody that said that they, that they thanked us for um, having the message there and that they did actually buy the game afterwards. Because I think um, some pirates do just pirate it to give it a go first. Um, I don't know what the conversion rate is <laughs> from that, but um, I think it's more than none. Um, and yeah, also Android, we expected Android was just basically going to be part of instantly. And we've sold about 10,000 on the Play Store and the game session started up as a lot more than 10,000. <laughs> it's about 120 something. So yeah, it just happens. I, I mean, free to play, if you can manage that, that kind of completely gets around it at all. But paid games, you just have to really roll with it. If you can turn it into a marketing thing, like of course the um, uh, Game Dev Tycoon, I think, has has an interesting thing about piracy in their game. Um, that's 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 great, but we didn't really worry about anything like that. We were just like, eh, it's going to happen. Uh, before we get to you, the numbers, so Mac users versus PC users on the store? Mac versus PC, yeah. Our game, uh, I, I talked to the Armello team and I know theirs are about these are a lot lower than ours. What's oh, sorry? Max 20%. Oh, 20%. Oh, okay. Oh, that's about what ours are. Okay, then. I don't know who was I was talking to, talking to them, but obviously they, they were wrong. Um, yeah, so it's about a fifth. Um, and also, we develop on Max anyway, so we're, it kind of had to be on Mac. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought ours was higher, but obviously it's not. <laughs> How do we choose our price point? This was a difficult one. Originally, I think developers have a tendency to undervalue their own work um, because you kind of get bored of it and think it's crap. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't enjoy playing my game. I think it. Yeah. Um, so we were originally going to sell it for four ninety nine on Steam. Um, however, when I was thinking about it myself, like I typically wouldn't even look at a game that was that much on Steam. I would because I'd be thinking five dollars. That can't be a very good game. Uh, so it's quite. I guess you really have to look at games that you feel offer a comparable experience or a similar genre and playtime. It, it's very, it's, there are kind of, I guess in the, in the indie space, there are like these kind of set price points, you know, so puzzle platform is about 15, um, a thing that's a bit more of a sort of double A game is probably like 20 to 25. Um, so you can work around that or you can you could just you know become the witness and say you know 40 bucks here I am and see how that goes.